Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler Unscripted. In today's episode, I'd like to consider whether the internet has ruined watches. Now, this seems like a very bold statement to start a piece like this with, but I think it's a fair question to ask. Because the internet has been around watches for around 20 years now, since the earliest forums at the turn of the century. And the internet has become the greatest repository of watch-related information we could ever have imagined. It's brought great riches in the forms of articles and great depths in terms of research and information. But then you do have to ask whether it's brought undue stress on the watch industry to the brands participating and created unrealistic goals in this market, whether it's inflated the market beyond control. But then again, you could ask whether it saved the watch industry in the face of new technology. This is particularly important to consider when the next couple of years show a great deal of uncertainty economically, but also in terms of there being an enormous oversaturation of watch brands offering very similar products. We also have a time during which it seems like watch shows and conventions are struggling to adapt to current circumstances. Just in the last few days, we've received information from both Baselworld and Watches and Wonders, with Watches and Wonders announcing that it will be having a new show in September in China, presumably to tap this enormous market and then we have an update from Baselworld, or what was formerly Baselworld, that it will be having a show in April 2021 and an ongoing internet presence in the months prior, in a way exactly what Watches and Wonders have done. But talking about those shows really is just scratching the surface. So in today's episode, let's look into how the internet has changed watches and what it means for the future. This week's episode is sponsored by Arage, the maker of unique watches for those who relish detail and innovation, at a sensible price, but more on that later. Do remember also that this piece is available as a podcast on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes and any other player you might enjoy, as well as on YouTube, although I admit that in today's episode there's not very much visual content because it just isn't that sort of piece. Now to understand the rise of watches on the internet, you have to look back to the late 90s when forums online were becoming a popular place to discuss watches and to learn more, and quite a few quite major characters nowadays started off on these particular forums discussing watches which they were passionate about. Of course early on there was a great deal of misinformation though, and unsurprisingly since these forums didn't have any official backing or standing. But then one does also have to consider the fact that it isn't surprising because even today a lot of brands don't know about their histories. And I'll spare any brands from being named here, but I do know a fair few who've been questioned about some pieces which are very commonly known by collectors and general enthusiasts about the brand, and they really don't have a clue what you're talking about. Which strikes me as absolutely staggering that there wouldn't have been some kind of documentation of the watches they produced, or of their history. By the early 2000s though, there was a change in watch culture. It wasn't mainstream, but there was a more clear path to the popularisation of watches after being reasonably ignored. Of course, this was backed up by the fact that in the 1990s there was a huge amount of work by brands like Omega, to start to create a, a name around watches like the Seamaster with James Bond, with the Speedmaster around the moon landing, and so that was starting to trickle into wider discussion. But by the early 2000s, publications like Revolution Watches, Hodinkee, started to change the way watches were looked at. This meant that watches weren't confined to enthusiasts considering very fine details and points, which are of fairly small consequence to the vast majority of people who enjoy watches, but this was also a time when the collectability of watches was starting to come into, into discussion. But this was also a new time in the auction world, because watches were starting to be considered as a collectible item. And you have to consider the fact that the 2000s were a time when Philips, for example, as an auction house, was starting to grow, and this was a time when watches were first looked at as something which could be desirable. And so with this new environment, watches became a collector's item, and by now they are of course very well established, with very high prices for some models which 20 years ago wouldn't have been anywhere near that valuable. Of course where money went, popularity went, and so a firm footing was created for watches, and by now we have a situation where online, whether you like watches which cost £50 or £500,000, you'll find a publication for you to be able to enjoy the aspect of watches which you most appreciate. And it's impossible to underestimate the positive aspects of watches being involved online, being popularised online, even being discussed online. Because many smaller brands, or even unknown brands, 
have flourished. I think the dive watch circle is an area which is particularly exciting here because a real history has been uncovered around dive watches, one which I personally find fascinating and really adore. But even brands like Tudor, which had been pulled from the US market for instance, came with a real resurgence as a result of new popularity around their history, around the products they produced, and offered a brand new line and have now done superbly well in the decade which they've enjoyed this sort of exposure. If you look to smaller brands though, you have brands like Doxa or Squale, which have enjoyed huge success and have developed real fan bases at their different prices because of the histories which they do have behind them. This also pulls onto the fact there is now proper scholarship about watches because there's enough money to justify it and I think that is a fairly honest way to put it. I think it would be nice to say that it's the passion which drove this scholarship but I think the fact that auction houses could make money and the fact that it was now becoming a profitable market was a very clear influence here. But the result is now that we have fantastically well formatted, very, very well considered and extremely well researched documentation and information about watches which were perhaps unknown 20 years ago. This leads back to the internet and the use of the internet because previously a lot of this documentation or any sort of written work about these watches was firstly very expensive but also often rather poorly formatted and also couldn't be adjusted when new information came to light. The last aspect really to consider is the vintage watch because vintage watches have become genuinely sought after and enjoyed by people and also this has introduced a new design language to brands in the current moment which often struggle to figure out what the next design or the next step is to produce a desirable looking watch and so looking to the past has given a lot of these brands food for thought. Of course I have to admit some of them have followed it rather too literally without amending it and adjusting it for modern tastes but nonetheless you have a situation where vintage watches have been given a new lease of life and a lot of watches which would previously have been lost because they weren't desirable have been found and have been catalogued which is an important aspect to developing a market and an audience around any particular collectible. But before considering the opposite side of the argument, the sponsor of this podcast is Arage, a brand which started with its own movement and created a company around it. After three generations, their K1 automatic movement offers a groundbreaking silicon escapement, 65 hour power reserve and the reliability of a truly tested movement. By taking an industrial approach to movement design, Araj have created a movement capable of widespread production with an unprecedented efficiency of manufacturing. The result is a movement which not only offers modern componentry, but also a modern design in a world of movements finding their roots in the 20th century. Modular by design, this movement additionally offers a large date, small seconds and power reserve built into the architecture, thus avoiding the addition of cumbersome modules. Despite its feature set, K1 fits into smaller cases and retains a slender form factor. In truth, this is the movement which I see as a real contender for the best of the current flock of luxury automatic movements. To learn more about Arage and the K1, head over to arage.com. But now we come to the other side of the argument, which is the side of negatives, or at least less helpful aspects to the increasing presence of watches online. And of course, the biggest increase, I think, in terms of changes where watches are concerned is the style of sales. Online sales are becoming a major reality of the watches I've bought recently the vast majority have been bought online with only the more valuable watches being bought in person because of the fact that nowadays it's very easy to return something if it isn't for you but when you're spending a little bit more money it is nice to have that personal involvement when you're purchasing the watch. But with these online sales and with a general interest in watches increasing via the internet it seems that over the past decade the market has become saturated with new brands popping up seemingly every few weeks. And this means that whilst each brand might sell some watches, it's very difficult to gain any long-standing presence, and only the most shrewd of brands are able to maintain their position. Now this isn't a bad thing per se, in the sense that we have a period of relative instability coming up as the, the effects of the financial problems building this year start to become known, and so I think it's fairly clear that a lot of these brands simply won't survive the next few years, leaving only the most interesting and in many ways the, the best presented and the best conceived. But it does mean that a lot of people who've invested in the watch world considerably will lose money. The next side to consider is the rise of small and micro brands, because these are brands which have really influenced the market in a very positive way in many ways. I think it's a market which has allowed a lot of people to enjoy watches 
which they perhaps wouldn't have enjoyed in the past or just which wouldn't have been produced. These small brands can also cater to an audience comprised of enthusiasts and fans and so don't have to market themselves to a wider audience but can focus on a smaller group. But there is a flip side and one which is worth considering. This is the fact that many of these watches, because of the low overheads of the brand producing the watches, because they're produced in a way to minimise costs, and also because these brands often don't have the same level of investment as brands aiming for a broader audience, tend to charge less than the, the brands which have, have invested. And so you have a situation where brands which are offering very, very good value, despite having spent an awful lot of money on investment, are undercut by brands which offer something for less money because they haven't had the same level of expenditure. And this creates artificially low prices and I think skews the market's view of what is good value and what isn't good value in a time when manufacturing watches is becoming more expensive for a lot of brands. A very common saving here is direct sales rather than selling through an authorised dealer. And there are benefits to direct sales, most notably a greater income for the brand and a greater margin for each watch sold. But there is a flip side there too, which is that you don't have the same customer relationship with the retailer and there isn't someone to go to somewhere in between if, for example, the brand doesn't deliver on the, on the sale of the watch or there's a problem. And this can negatively influence the buyer at the end of the, the road, but it's also losing a lot of jobs in terms of people operating in that in between with real specialist knowledge on how to manage the sales of watches which often aren't terribly well managed by the brands themselves. And this is why I think that authorised dealers make a lot of sense as the face which you interact with when you're buying a watch. In my opinion, the most interesting side to the impact of the internet on watches, which is again both positive and negative, is the influence of fan bases, of forums, and of enthusiasts groups. Because these have the benefit of allowing people to really discuss and enjoy their passion, and that's fantastic. And something which was long lacking in this field of, of watch enthusiasts who often were fairly isolated and just enjoyed the watches on their own. So being able to speak to other people about it is a really very nice community aspect and gives a nice feel to the watch industry in general. But there are some negatives too, and often when brands follow the in enthusiast views too closely. A really good example would be the Zin U200, a watch now discontinued and replaced by the much more sensible U50. But the U200 was a 2000 meter, 37 millimeter dive watch. And it's the sort of watch which a lot of enthusiasts said, yes, we do want to have this. We want a smaller dive watch for, for smaller wrists. And, and that's the product we want to buy. And the result was that Zinn produced this watch, a quite thick, very resilient, but thoroughly misproportioned watch for an audience which ultimately didn't exist. There were far too few people to buy the watch and those who did buy the watch often found that it was too small anyway and wanted something larger because the proportions were right. And this is a typical example of a brand producing a small dive watch for the current fad of producing smaller watches, which tends to appeal to enthusiasts, but not to the average buyer. And this is a difficult point because what someone likes on paper is often very different to what they actually enjoy on the wrist when it's designed for them. After all, this is why journalists aren't asked to design watches because the truth is I don't think any journalist would view themselves capable of doing so because that's a specialist job for someone who really knows what they're doing. Another side to the community around watches online is the negativity, which is unfortunate and certainly doesn't involve everyone. But I think it's often a case where when something becomes popular online and, and it's an anonymous medium, inevitably people are rather rude to each other and you end up with quite toxic environments very often on forums with a very particular agenda. And often there's misinformation involved too, which results in brands often being unfairly accused of things and without a really very clear and easy way to present the facts and defend themselves. And I think this can unfortunately put people off enjoying watches, but can also rather upset the situation with brands with rather negative and often untrue rumours being peddled, which tend to be repeated so many times that they develop a grain of truth in the eyes of someone who doesn't actually have the opportunity to speak to the brand. And the final point to consider is the fact that the way the internet has progressed and evolved means that it's very common to buy and sell watches very frequently and very easily and very quickly. And often this results in a destabilised market where watches are being bought and sold so quickly that their value plummets on the used market, which is a shame and often, often impacts certain products more than others. 
but it also means that often people are more keen to buy a used product for a considerably lower price than buy the new product because the prices have been dropped so much on the used market. And this is an aspect which inevitably is a product of the internet and a worldwide market, and also ease of sales worldwide without having to go through real trouble to order something from far away. But of course this is a debate with endless different views and perspectives, and so I'd be fascinated to hear what you have to say about it in the comments section below. Of course if you enjoyed this piece, whether on YouTube or anywhere else, do like, share and subscribe to help us, because it really is much appreciated and means that you'll be able to catch all the latest podcasts, videos and articles, whether you're listening to them, watching them or reading them on watchchronicler.com. But thank you very much for listening. This is Armon from watchchronicler.com, out.